Hi, I'm Chef Taylor. I'm a classically trained French chef. I'm here to teach you a little bit about French food, and hopefully with a little scientific understanding, you can learn to recreate these classical French dishes in your own kitchen. Today's episode will be about recreating French classics in a way that's more manageable for the home chef. So for our first recipe, we're going to be looking at stock. This is a standard liquid that you would find in almost any restaurant or professional kitchen. So really all that has to happen to produce stock is you need to take your meat and you need to put it into a pot. Like so. And then what you need to do is fill it with a little water. You'll want to fill up your stock pot with enough water to just cover your ingredients. That way it can maximally extract any of the flavors and gelatin that you need for your stock. And now we'll put this into the oven. I will clean up and then we can move on to our boeuf bourguignon. Here are the initial ingredients for our boeuf bourguignon. This is our beef. This is a cut from the shoulder of the cattle. Uh, it's also known as beef chuck. It's an inexpensive cut of meat, largely because it's so tough. Um, it, there's a lot of connective tissue in it. And this makes it difficult to, not difficult to cook, but difficult to make soft. It takes considerable amount of time. You can't just throw it in a pan like you can uh, filet mignon, for instance. Uh, this, the reason that it's so tough, and this is what we touched on when we were discussing stock, is it has a fair amount of connective tissue, which is really tough and does not soften up very quickly. Uh, this is where a slow cooking application really comes in handy which is exactly what we're going to do. When you actually cook this, you're actually cooking the meat beyond well done. And you can see here some of the marbling. A lot of this is actually connective tissue and is, is quite tough. In cuts of meat that don't have as much connective tissue, like filet mignon, all you need to do is cook it to the requisite temperature to achieve a certain level of doneness. And doneness is entirely dependent on those temperatures. For instance, if you cook a filet mignon to 125 degrees Fahrenheit all the way through, you're going to get a medium rare meat. If you cook it beyond that, you'll keep going up into your levels of doneness. Beyond 150, 155 degrees Fahrenheit, your meat is well done and that is where the proteins in your meat have actually unwound and then bound together and they actually wring out water, kind of like wringing out a rag or a sponge. And that lack of water is what makes us perceive it as being so tough. Now, ordinarily this would, is a problem, but when you have so much connective tissue, the connective tissue melts into gelatin and that takes the place of water. So you still feel that nice, juicy texture. So what we're going to do is we are going to cut this into pieces, nice, pretty substantial cubes. Um, they will, in fact, shrink up a fair amount. So it's always good to go a little bit larger than you would think. Now going to take my meat and put it in my pan Listen to that nice sizzle. 
You don't want to keep them too close together. This is often referred to as not crowding the pan. Uh, this is because it will decrease the temperature of the pan too much and you won't get that nice sear on the outside. Which I should mention, contrary to popular belief, does absolutely nothing to keep the juices in the meat. It's strictly for flavor. What you'll do is you'll wait a few minutes. Now it depends on how hot you have your pan, but it should be pretty hot. Um, and you'll want to brown a few sides of this. So we'll check here and see. This is one of the first pieces I put down. This has a nice brown color to it. So we'll take this, flip this to another side, do this with uh, all the other pieces of meat. This will be a two-step browning process. We're first going to brown these pieces of meat. We'll get all of them browned up and then we're going to cover it with flour and brown it again. You'll see this bowl here. I'm going to put a little flour in and any pieces that are done browning, I'm going to put in that bowl to prepare it uh, to flour and then brown again. So now the last bit of this meat has been browned for the first time. We'll get this into our bowl. We'll let this sit and cool for a bit. In the meantime, we will take our bacon. This might be the more familiar look to you. This is what you'd see in your supermarket bacon. So now what we're going to do is we're going to cut up little pieces of this bacon. All right, so now that we have these roughly cut laudon, which is a piece of bacon, um, we're going to put this in the pan. We're putting this bacon in for two purposes. One, we're going to provide the bacon with a, a cooked flavor, which will be nice to add to our boeuf bourguignon. And additionally, this will render or melt the fat that's on here, which is also a very powerful flavor agent that will be really enjoyable in the finished stew. So you can keep this on pretty high, and then just make sure that it cooks. All right, it appears our bacon is nicely cooked nicely browned and we have a really nice amount of bacon fat left in this pan that we'll use for the second browning of our floured meat. Traditionally, the bacon is taken off and reserved, in other words, kept in a bowl, for instance, for use later. But I actually enjoy it added back with the beef to be coated in flour and browned a second time. Now, uh, you'll notice that I'm tipping the pan. This is to keep as much of the fat in the pan as possible because we're going to be using this fat to brown our beef and our bacon again. All right, now we're going to take some of this liquid that's collected at the bottom and we are going to reserve this for later. Simply take a bowl of some kind and maybe by cradling it with the spatula, pour off that excess liquid. And then we will proceed to flour this. So we'll add a little bit to the top, and then we're going to mix it up. Now this will get a bit gelatinous and sort of gloopy looking. That's a technical culinary term, which is what you want. This is effectively making some kind of, almost like a, a deep fry batter that we're going to shallow fry. And this will make this nice crust and you will get a nice browning of the flour, which is a 
slightly different brown taste. Okay, you can see that this is nicely coated. Doesn't look nice, but it will be very nice in a moment. So, making sure that our pan is nice and hot. And we will add in a few pieces at a time. You can see it's starting to bubble. And when you add flour, it will bubble a lot more than it would normally. All right, this first batch here is done. We're going to go ahead and put it into our casserole bowl, making sure that you leave behind the fat because you need this to brown the rest of the meat as well as give a little color to the onions and celery that we have here, which we will do right after browning this second batch. All right, these are nicely brown. So we're going to tip this again to allow the fat to drip to the front so we can take it off and leave it in the pan because we'll need this for the vegetables. Okay. So you'll note that this part is pretty dark, what's been left in the pan. This is absolutely okay. If you don't like it quite so brown, I think it adds a nice deepening and darkening of the flavors, then don't keep it on quite as long. Now we will add the vegetables. You'll note that these are really roughly chopped. Um, I call these my sacrificial vegetables. Uh, they're really roughly cut because their main purpose is to add flavor to our stew. So we're looking for a little bit of color in both the onions and the celery, but not a full-on caramelization. You'll also see that there are little brown or dark flecks from all the meat we've been cooking. This is, of course, fine because that's what's in our casserole bowl. These will be ready in a few minutes. Um, You'll also note that previously, when we were browning the meat for a second time, that we used flour. And those of you with gluten sensitivities, it's perfectly fine to use any other starch that might not cause you problems, like cornstarch. All right, so these are nicely, nicely browned, very lightly. We really don't need much, just to add a little flavor. And then we will add these to our casserole dish. Now this is almost ready for the oven. All we need to do is add a little bit of our seasoning, our bay leaf. Add three or four, that'll be fine. Um, and then a few sprigs of thyme. and then make sure that everything's nice and flattened out. We will then add our wine. Now it's okay if it doesn't come all the way up, but it's nice to have it pretty close to the top of your ingredients. Now we're going to add our last and one of the most important ingredients, salt. You can be pretty liberal with the amount of salt that you add because as this cooks, it will absorb into the meat and it will not taste as salty. Give it a good mix so that the salt can go all throughout the rest of your boeuf bourguignon and then we'll be ready to put it into the oven. And while we wait for that to cook, we will prepare the additional vegetables, which we will add at the end when we plate.
Now we'll be working on the second part of this recipe where we'll be sauteing our vegetables that we're keeping out of the stew so that we can really concentrate their flavor. First we'll start with mushrooms. We'll pour a little oil into this pan. Make sure that it is nice and hot, which one this one is. And we'll place them on. We're gonna keep these whole, largely for presentation purposes. Once all the vegetables have been added to the pan or properly sauteed, we'll be adding the stock that we finished and letting that reduce to add a really nice and concentrated meat flavor to these vegetables. We'll leave these to fry on this side until they're nice and brown. Fortunately, mushrooms are pretty forgiving, so we can keep them on for sort of any amount of time, but once they start to get soft, we're going to flip them. All right, so now we'll flip each one over to the other side, and as I said, it doesn't really matter that much if you've cooked some more than others. You can see here that this one's actually pretty brown. Some might even say black, but that's all right. Um, part of that will come off and become a part of the flavor of these sauteed mushrooms. We'll let these sit for maybe another minute or two, but really time is less important. You can't taste time, you can taste flavor. Uh, so really look to see that the other side has also started to soften or to see that it's browned and press down to see if it's softened. Now that these are nicely browned on both sides, and nice and soft. Again, these will be cooked further in a little bit. We're going to reserve these and move on to our carrots and our peeled pearl onions. Now you'll probably have to add a little more oil because mushrooms tend to absorb whatever you've put into the pan. Add our oil to our hot frying pan and now we'll add our onions. The fire is entirely unnecessary, but fun. Now we add our carrots. Make sure that the carrots also are touching the bottom of the pan. If they're sitting on top of the onions, they're not going to cook evenly. We'll add a little seasoning, a little salt. We'll let these go for a little bit until they start to brown. Once they've started to brown, we'll add the stock and let that help cook the vegetables more evenly. And then we'll let that reduce until it has a really nice consistency and is no longer liquidy. So these have started to brown nicely, and now it's time to add a little bit of the liquid that we had in reserve from the meat. This will concentrate down and add a really nice flavor. We'll also add a little supplemental stock. We'll also season this, but we'll wait for the end. Um, your stock and our meat juices do have a little bit of salt in them, so it's always nice to know how much salt you have in there because you can't remove salt. So we'll let this reduce. I've been letting this reduce for about four or five minutes now. Uh, this is obvious by how much less water there is in here, but you can also tell by the sizzling sound that it's making. Now we're going to add the mushrooms back in. We didn't add them in earlier because they would have absorbed too much of the liquid and it would have not been very concentrated. We really just want there to be just enough thick liquid to coat these mushrooms. Give these a nice mix. Make sure they're nicely coated. You can see that there's really not much left in the way of water in this pan, and that's a good thing. That will really give a nice and concentrated flavor. 
Once there's really not much liquid left in the pan, you are ready to go. These can come off the heat and you can reserve these to be put on the plate just before you put the stew on. Now, I like to add my tomato paste at the end. It's all right if you add it at the beginning of your boeuf bourguignon or you can add it in the middle or whenever. I have no problem adding it toward the end. Now that we've completed all the components for the boeuf bourguignon, we're now going to work on a dessert to accompany it. Today we'll be making tarte tatin, which is the French version of the apple pie. To start off, we're going to keep put a pan on, keep it on low heat, and we'll add some butter. Now traditionally this is rubbed into the pan, but this is really unnecessary as you heat the pan and it melts and distributes itself everywhere anyway. Uh, I'm putting in probably about roughly, roughly a stick of butter. Um, the important part is that you do get it everywhere and get it to melt. Now you'll be adding some sugar. Roughly mm, quarter of a cup, a little more, a third of a cup. You'll add more in a bit once you add the apples. And now we're going to add the apples. You can arrange them neatly and make sort of a, a flowered shape. Um, it doesn't really matter. This is all personal preference. I really, it of course is much easier to just dump in the apples. But really you're looking for a nice even layer. This is a pretty traditional rustic dish, so it's okay if it looks a little messy. Now that we've added the apples, we're going to add some additional sugar on top. So in total, you're adding somewhere around three quarters of a cup, maybe even a cup of sugar. And what we're trying to achieve is a nice caramel, which will be done by heating up the sugar enough so that it starts to break down and change colors. This is not traditional, but I like to add a little cream. I think it makes for a better tasting caramel. If you've ever had a caramel sauce on a dessert, it very likely had cream in it. So we'll add a little cream. Not much, it's probably a quarter or a third of a cup. And we'll turn the heat up to about medium. And in the meantime, we will prepare our puff pastry. I've selected this plate because it is roughly the size of this pan, which is where our dessert will be cooked in the oven. So I'm just going to place this down and use this to trace our rolled out puff pastry. This will come in virtually any grocery store and they're often not quite large enough to fit a pan this size. So if necessary, just take your rolling pin and roll it out. But I have already done that. Remove the excess. You can save this for later. Flour it a little bit and put it in a bag and you can keep it in your freezer and use it for other purposes. Once this starts to take on more of a brown color and caramelize, I'm going to take this puff pastry and put it on top while it's still on the stove and let it rise a little bit. Then I'll place it into a 350 degree oven and leave it there for 10 to 20 minutes until it's nice and golden brown on top. In the meantime, while this is in the oven, I'll plate up the boeuf bourguignon, and then when we come back, I'll be presenting all of the dishes that we've done today. Here are all the dishes that we made today. First was our meat stock, wherein we took bones and meat and extracted their flavor and gelatin in water over 12 hours in the oven. Here we have our boeuf bourguignon, where we took our tough cut of meat, the chuck, and we braised it in a liquid of wine and various herbs. And then we took our mushrooms and carrots 
and onions and cook those separately to consolidate and keep their flavors distinct from the stew and added those separately at the end. And finally we have our tartatin, which is essentially an upside down apple pie where we took and caramelized apples with sugar and butter and a little cream and then layered on top of that puff pastry which we let rise a bit in the pan and then finished off in the oven. Thank you for joining me on this scientifically informed French adventure. I'm Chef Taylor and I hope to see you next time.